Uh, good morning, all. Uh, today's topic is on the history of medicine, and we have an eminent speaker, Dr. Sunil Pandya. So let me begin with a brief introduction about him. Uh, he is an alumnus of uh, Grand Medical College and Sir JJ Group of Hospitals, Mumbai. He obtained his MBBS from the University of Bombay in 1961 and MS. General Surgery in 1965. His training in neurosurgery was under the guidance and supervision of Dr. Rajendra Singh at JJ Hospital and Dr. Homi Dastur at KM Hospital. Later, he pursued specialty training in the Institute of Neurology, London. He was appointed Professor of Neurosurgery at St. Gordangas. Sundardas Medical College and King Edward VII Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, in 1975, and retired on superannuation in 1998. He is currently a consultant neurosurgeon at Jasno Hospital and Research Center. He has written essays in scientific journals as well as popular press on neurosurgery the history of medicine and issues pertaining to ethics in medicine. He is the emeritus editor of the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics and serves on the editorial boards of medical journals such as the National Medi Medical Journal of India and Men's Sana Monographs. Dr. Pandya is a life member of the Neurological Society of India and Asiatic Society of Bombay. So, with this brief introduction, I uh, welcome, sir. Good morning to you, sir. Thank and you. I request you to start your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. I'm very grateful to Dr. Shenvi the professor and the head of the Department of Physiology for inviting me to deliver this lecture and to Dr. Ramakrishna Kamath, the assistant professor of physiology, who has helped me organize this lecture in such a way that it can be broadcast over um, Zoom. I apologize for not being able to come in person but that is because I fractured my hip some time ago and that hip joint is still uh, somewhat painful and uh, gives me a little bit of trouble. <clears throat> now let's go on to the topic for the day, which is the history of medicine. Uh, on the slide, which you are now looking at, you will find that my title is an introduction to the history of medicine. And that is because, and that is because the history of medicine is a huge subject and it cannot be covered in a, an hour or two or even in a couple of days time. It's an enormous subject. So all that I can do today is to just introduce you to the subject and hope that you will be uh, convinced that it is worth your while to study this subject. The next word you will see underlined in the title is the word history. Now we are conditioned by the training that we receive in our schools. <clears throat> and so we are led to believe that history is dates, dynasties, the Mughal Empire, the Maurya Empire, and so on lists of invasions, this is when so-and-so invaded India and this is when so-and-so invaded this state or that state. And then all about mausoleums and politics and government and lists of presidents and lists of governor generals and all that sort of thing. That is not history. History is actually made up of stories. And these stories are worth learning and listening to and reading about because they educate us. And in particular, when we talk of the history of medicine, these stories tell us about the giants 
who created the information and the expertise which we take for granted every day when we go about our work dealing with patients in clinics, in hospitals, in our general practice dispensaries and so on. So they educate us on the lives and the work of the giants on whose shoulders we stand. And that is why we need to read, learn about and study history. And history also is, serves as an inspiration. And you will see in the course of the talk, a few examples of individuals who command inspiration. Now, of late, <clears throat> there is a move that so far, as the word itself suggests, his story talks about all males and only males who have contributed to the development of medicine, which of course is rubbish because women have contributed at least as much and in some areas they have contributed even more. So there are those who claim that the word history should be set side by side with her story. So it should be his story and her story. <clears throat> I'm going to try and concentrate on India and the giants that India has produced and who have inspired us. But I'm not only going to talk of ancient and old physicians and clinicians and pathologists and surgeons, but I'm also going to talk on a few contemporary individuals who are with us even today. Now, if you look at this slide, the top list, the pictures at the top are about people who are dead and gone. Sushrut and Charak, of course, were about 400 to 200 before the Christian era. Jivak was around the fifth or sixth century AD. Dr. Acacio Vegas was in the 19th century. And Dr. Rustam Jal Vakil, who is or was a professor in the Sage GS Medical College and KEM Hospital, and after whom the Department of Cardiology in KEM Hospital is named, he was 20th century. And the four individuals and couples that have been shown down below are people who are still with us and they are doing remarkable work. I hope to be able to talk on some of them during this talk. <coughs> now, let us start with the very beginning. Let us start with medicine in the ancient world. And again, if we concentrate on India, the knowledge that we possess today, we are told that it stems from four very, very important documents or um, treatises which were handed over by the gods to us human beings. And these have been named the Atharva Ved, the Rig Ved, the Sam Ved, and the Yajur Ved. And they are called the Veds from the Sanskrit root of the word Ved. Ved means to know, to know, learn, understand. And so that is why these four uh, great treatises have been called the Veds. And everything we are told, all the knowledge that we have is derived from these four Veds. Now, we are really concerned with the Atharva Ved. And the Atharva Ved is so-called because of the author of this Ved, <clears throat> who is supposed to be Atharvan. And so it is called the Atharva Ved. And the Atharva Ved is concerned with medicine and the health sciences. And that is why it is the Ved which is of maximum importance to us. Now, this is an imaginary drawing of the Ved, the Ved, Atharva Ved being handed over by the Matsya Altar, which is on the left hand side, to Charak. And Charak is seated in the center with the snake uh, heads uh, behind him. 
And this is an imagined portrait just to show us how the gods had handed this information over to human beings. And this pertains to the handing over of the Atharva Ved to Charak. Now, Charak and Sushrut and all these ancient physicians of India, very, very respected, very, very knowledgeable, and truly great scientists, they sponsored or they created what we now call Ayurveda. The literal translation of Ayurveda is the science of life. And you will see the derivation on the first line in this slide. Now, Ayurveda has some very interesting concepts within it. In the Ayurvedic scripts, in the Ayurvedic classics, you will find that Ayurveda is boundless. That means the science of life has no limits. It is eternal. It is true for all time. And it is auspicious. Why is it boundless? Because we can never stop learning about the science of life. It is an endless quest that we embark on when we come to medical college and start studying medicine. This study of medicine does not stop when you graduate. It will continue till the day you die. And that is why it is boundless. It has no limits. It is eternal because the truths within this science are true for all time. It is auspicious because it benefits sick and ill and people who are in pain and people who are dying. It helps them. And that is why it is auspicious. It encompasses knowledge on the causes of disease, symptoms, signs, tests, and remedies. Now, as you proceed through the various classes in the first MBBS and the second MBBS and the third MBBS, you will learn the differences between symptoms and signs and how to elicit symptoms and how to elicit signs and what are the tests we need to do to make a diagnosis or confirm a diagnosis and what are the modes of therapy that are available to us to treat our patients. Another very, very important aspect of Ayurveda, which is not emphasized in modern medicine, is that the science of life caters to health and illness. Remember, not only illness, health and illness of mind, body, senses, and even the soul. So, it is supposed to address our innermost being and it is supposed to make us conscious of what we do when we treat our patients. And it is the, this science of Ayurveda is said to have its origins around 2000 before the Christian era, 2000 BC. We are now in 2022 AD. So it is at least 4,000 years old, this science. And this is how this science was taught. It was not taught as you are being taught now in an auditorium or a lecture theater. It was taught by a guru to his pupils, sometimes in his home, sometimes in a common area like under the people tree, or sometimes in a forest, it was taught by one individual to a few interested persons. So it was a guru-shishya relationship. And this guru-shishya relationship still persists when you go to fields like music, where the guru-shishya parampara is very, very important. We can't afford to have the guru-shishya parampara in medicine because the number of students is so big that we cannot afford one teacher with four students or one teacher with five students. But in those days, sometimes the students lived in the teacher's home and they served the teacher and the teacher in turn taught them. Now let's go to Charak and Sushruta, the two great figures in ancient Indian medicine. 
Chalak was a physician. Sushrut, which you see on the right, was a surgeon. Now, I must caution you that these pictures that you see are all works of imagination. We really don't know what Chadak looked like and what Sushrut looked like. This is the imagination of the artist, that this is what Chadak may have looked like. This is what Sushruta may have been doing his operations in this manner. So we really don't know what they look like. We have no authentic uh, depictions of their uh, physical appearances. Let me take you to Charak's advice to the student. Since you are students, and since you have just entered medical college, and since you're going to proceed eventually to become doctors and treat patients, this is his, his advice to you. If you desire to achieve success, always seek the good of all living creatures. Not only all human beings, but all living creatures. Cat, dog, monkey, mouse, whatever it be. Seek the good of all living creatures. Then Charak advises us as to how we should deal with our patients. Speak words that are soft unstained by impurity. That means your work, words must convey honest sentiments, honest advice, no impurity in it at all, full of righteousness, incapable of giving pain. Do not speak in such a manner that the patient is subjected to pain. Do not be arrogant. Do not treat the individual who is in front of you as if he was somebody beneath you or as if he's a nuisance. He has come to seek your help. So treat him as you would treat your own relative, for instance, and so on. I mean, he gives some advice like this, and then he emphasizes, which I've already emphasized earlier, there is no end to medical science. Hence, heedfully devote yourself to it. And the last sentence I think is very interesting. The whole world is a teacher to the wise. Now, we often tend to think that our teachers are our lecturers and our professors and our registrars and those who are senior to us. But we can also learn from simple people. Many of the older generations of surgeons, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, learned the skill of stitching from cobblers and from weavers. Surgeons learned how to stitch by watching a cobbler or a weaver doing his work. There is no one from whom you cannot learn. If you are wise and if you try and learn, you will find something that you can learn from everybody. And that's a very, very important piece of advice. Now, you may have read in the papers in the last few days that there is a proposal in India for replacing what was called the Hippocratic Oath by something called the Charak Shapat. Now, this Charak Shapat is an honor or is homage which the country, our country, wishes to give Charak. Now, up to now, the custom has been that when a medical student graduates, he is given a piece of paper on which is an oath, which was written by a Greek ancient physician. He was more or less of the same age as Tarak and Sushruta, about 200 years BC or so. <clears throat> so it is that oath which Hippocrates prescribed to his students which is given to us when we graduate. And we are told to read this oath and it is hoped that we will follow what is in that oath. So what our authorities are now saying is that we have our own oath, we have Charak's oath. Why should we follow Hippocratic oath? And so there is a move to replace the Hippocratic oath by the Charak oath. Now, Unfortunately, after the great Indian masters, 
of medicine like Charak. So I've given you a few names over here. And by about um, 200, 300 AD, which means about 400, 500 years after Charak and Sushrut, the spirit of inquiry and innovation disappeared from Indian medicine. And medicine in India was taught by father to son and son to grandson and so on, using the ancient books that had been written by Charak, Sushrut, Vagbhat, Bail, and Jiva. So there was no new knowledge which was being added. And the science of medicine stagnated. And this is why we entered what we now call the dark ages of Indian medicine. Indian medicine declined because the science of Indian medicine remained the science of 200 BC or 100 AD or thereabouts. Now, on the other hand, Islamic medicine reached its peak <clears throat> between 800 and 1200 AD. And Yunani medicine, which is another form of medicine which is practiced in India, is based on the ancient principles of Greek medicine. And it was introduced into India by the Turks and the Afghans and the Persians between 1200 and 1400 AD. So by about 1400, 1500 AD, the truly scientific medicine was Islamic medicine and Yunani medicine because Ayurvedic medicine had decayed by that time. And by the 16th and the 17th centuries, Indian physicians were divorced from the principles of inquiry and experimentation. And medicine cannot progress without this kind of a spirit where you keep asking questions and you keep performing experiments in order to learn and advance scientific knowledge. So the scientific revolution which occurred in the West bypassed India. And we were in a very, very sad state when the Europeans came to India, the Portuguese and the Danes and the French and of course the English. And this is more or less what our understanding of anatomy was. <clears throat> Around 1700, 1800 of uh, AD, this is our understanding of anatomy. And I think even you, although you have not yet finished your course of anatomy, will understand that this is a very crude and very simple, simplistic kind of illustration. But this is what was there around 1600, 1700 AD in India. And this is how medicine was practiced in India. <clears throat> Diagnosis was mainly by examining the pulse, that was diagnosis. Treatment was mainly herbs and potions which were made from herbs. Surgery was very elementary. Now here you see a person treating a cataract and you can see what a difficult problem it must be for the patient to have a cataract operated upon in this manner. And even in the early 20th century, this is more or less a general physician's office. He had this kind of a stat, uh, figure and bottles of medicine. And sometimes he, when he had no patients, he would be reading something or the other. Not the medicine that we envisage. Meanwhile, abroad in the Western world, <coughs> things were changing dramatically. Universities were formed between the 12th and the 15th century. And they were formed, as you will see on the right side, and also as you will see in the map in the center, Cambridge and Oxford in Britain, Paris in France, <clears throat> Freiburg and Cologne in Germany, Basel in Switzerland, Padua, Bologna and Salerno in Italy, and Coimbra and Lisbon in Portugal here. And these were the places where learning advanced where people asked questions, where they did experiments, and where they learned how the structure of the human body was made and how it could go wrong and what should be done to correct that wrong functioning of the human body. 
So the universities were set up between the 12th and the 15th century. And each of these universities was a superb institution. And there were many people from Britain, for instance, who went to Padua and Bologna in Italy to learn medicine. There were many from Germany and Portugal and France who came to Cambridge and Oxford to listen to learn medicine. And today, many of these universities are now much, much uh, reduced in their efficacy and in the kind of output that they bring out, except for Cambridge and Oxford. Now, these were the, some of the great physicians of yesterday. And I'm going to talk to you, I, I, I hope that you will try and learn about each of these individuals on your own, because I cannot tell you about each of these individuals. If I start doing it, this talk will end tomorrow morning. And I think that will be a bit difficult for you. So I am only going to talk about the first two people, Claudius Gallen over here and Andreas Vesalius over here. Now, if you look about Claudius Gelen, you will find that he was in the period 130 to 210 AD. <clears throat> Vesalius, on the other hand, is 1300 years later. And it is important to remember this because Claudius Gelen became very famous as an anatomist. He has written something like 16 or 20 books on anatomy and variety of other subjects. And he became very, very famous. Now at that time, around 200 to 300 AD, the church in Rome became very, very powerful. And the rules and regulations laid down by the church were followed all over the parts of the world which were Christian. That means all the European countries and wherever the Christians had settled. The church ruled that whatever Claudius Gelen taught was correct and should not be challenged. Now let us see what Claudius Gelen taught. Claudius Gelen said that the liver human liver is multilobular. So it has got a number of nodes. Whereas when you study your anatomy in the anatomy class, you will see that this is not true. There are two main lobes and there's a small lobe in the middle. <clears throat> it is not a multilobular liver. Claudius Gallen also taught that at the base of the human brain, is a network of blood vessels, which uh, he believed was an important network of blood vessels. He called it the reti mirabili, the miraculous network. When you dissect the brain during your classes, you will not find any reti mirabili because the human skull and the human brain has no reti mirabili. But Claudius Galen said there is a reti mirabili. And the church said that Claudius Galen cannot be challenged. So textbooks, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, for 1300 years, 1300 years, it was taught that there is a reti mirabili in the brain and the liver is multilobular. I mean, I'm just giving you two examples. There were other mistakes also. Now, why did Claudius Galen, who was a great scientist, make such mistakes? He made these mistakes because animals, particularly the pig and some other animals, they have a reti mirabili and they have a multilobular liver. So he dissected an animal found something in it and said human beings also do it. They also have it. The reason was that dissection of human beings was not allowed. It was frowned upon by the church. 
And so Claudius Gallant extrapolated findings in animals and said that these findings exist in human beings. And for 1300 years, just imagine 1300 years, what a period that is. Everyone kept on saying, teachers kept on telling the students and the students kept on telling their students that there is a ratty mirabili and the liver is multilobular. Till this man, Andreas Vesalius, till this man came on the scene and he dissected human beings. And you can see him. He's in the act of dissecting a human being in this picture. <clears throat> when he dissect, actually there are very interesting stories about the difficulties he had in getting specimens for dissection. Because dissection was still frowned upon. Bodies were not available for dissection. The privilege that you have of walking into the dissection room and finding a whole array of bodies laid down for you to dissect didn't exist at that time. And the means by which Andreas Vesalius obtained bodies for dissection was such, if he was caught, he had to steal human bodies. He had to steal them. And if he was caught stealing, he himself would have been executed. But that's a completely different story for a different time. So we will set that aside. And when he dissected human beings, he started publishing his findings. And he said, the human brain has no retimilar. And the human liver is not multilobulated. And many other mistakes which had occurred in Galen's work. He said, this is all wrong. This is not correct. Now, because he had challenged what Galen said, the church tried to victimize him and he was harassed quite a bit. But by that time, by 1500, the power of the church had diminished. And so Andreas Vesalius was able to escape with his life. Otherwise, if he had done that in say 500 AD or 600 AD, he would have been executed by the church. But because it was 1500, he survived. But still, it took 1,300 years for mistakes made in 210 or 200 AD to be corrected. Now, each of these other personalities, Andrea Ambroas Pare, William Harvey, John Hunter, Louis Pasteur, they are all immensely interesting people. And they made huge contributions to medicine. And I would strongly urge you to try and learn more about each and every one of them. I wish I had the time to tell you about them, but I don't. And these are some of the later individuals in Western medicine. And some of these names may be familiar to you. The name of Sigmund Freud, for instance, you must be familiar with and you probably know very well. The name of Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin. Some of these will be very known to you. The name which may not be very familiar to you is the name of Elizabeth Blackwell. Elizabeth Blackwell was the first lady to become a doctor. Women were not permitted to enter medical schools. In fact, teachers used to frown on women and say, medicine is not for you. You continue looking after the home. That's all that you're meant for. And Elizabeth Blackwell said, what rubbish. Of course we can learn medicine. And she breached this citadel, this fort, which males had built all around the profession of medicine. She broke that fort and she entered medicine and became a physician. And she opened the doors for other women to enter the medical profession. And those amongst you who are belonging to the gentler sex must pay homage to Elizabeth Blackwell and the other women pioneers who made it possible for you to enter medical college and learn medicine. Now let's come to recent Indian history, medical history. And these are the modern Indian medical giants. 
these are individuals who were able to flourish in scientific medicine because they had learned at the hands of the British. When the British came to India in 1835, from 1835 to about 1845, they set up three important medical colleges. The first medical college was set up in Calcutta because that was the capital of India. The second medical college was set up in Madras and the third medical college was set up in Bombay. Bombay was set up in 1845. That was the Grand Medical College, the sister institution to our GS Medical College. Bao Daji belonged to the first batch of students who entered the Grand Medical College in 1845. And Bao Daji became so good as a physician and as a surgeon that after graduation, when he entered medical practice, his medical practice, and he practiced along with his younger brother. So his younger brother's name was Narayan. So Bhav Daji and Narayan Daji, they had a practice which rivaled the practice of the European physicians of Bombay City. They had more patients than the European doctors who were in private practice in the city of Bombay had. So in a short while, Bhav Daji became one of the leading physicians of Bombay. I must talk a little bit about the lady who is next to Bhav Daji, and that is Anandi Bhai. But I'm sure many of you know about Anandi Bhai. Anandi Bhai Joshi is the first Indian woman to become a qualified physician. But she didn't train in medicine in India. She trained in medicine in Philadelphia. And she became a physician from the Women's Medical College of Philadelphia. Her goal was to come back and serve women in India, because women in India did not like to be treated by male physicians. So her goal was to come back and serve them. But unfortunately, she developed tuberculosis and she died. So she couldn't fulfill, <clears throat> fulfill her goal, but she remains the first Indian woman to become a doctor. I think you should also learn about all Waldemar Hafkin. Waldemar Hafkin was of an Indian, he was a Russian, but he did some fantastic work in India <clears throat> on cholera and on the plague. And I think that is why we have an institution <clears throat> which is very close to the GS Medical College, which is named after him. It is called the Hafkin Institute. This is the Hafkin of Hafkin Institute and so on. Each of these other individuals who I've put up here, they have remarkable stories, absolutely remarkable story. And I've already told you a little bit about Rustam Jalwaki. I think you should try and learn about these individuals as well. <clears throat> now, when we learn about these great giants, and many of these giants functioned in medical colleges and hospitals, big hospitals, and big medical colleges, we must never forget that there are doctors who work away from the medical college. There are doctors who work in villages. There are doctors who work in tribal areas. There are doctors who work in small towns and big towns. And there are doctors who treat patients like this little child over here, whom you can see is suffering from severe malnutrition. So there are these heroic doctors who are working at grassroot level. Many of them have no facilities or very few facilities. They have very little by way of support and yet they are doing a magnificent job within the limits of their capabilities. And we need to learn about them as well because they are also part of the history of medicine. And here are some of these individuals. 
I think all of you probably know the one who is in the top center, Murli Dhar Devi Das Amte. You probably know him better <clears throat> as Baba Amte. And I think his work is so well known that I don't really need to talk about that. To our right of Baba Amte is his son, Prakash Amte. And Mandakini Amte is Prakash's wife. And you can see the malnourished tribal individual that they are treating. These are also heroic figures in medicine. Their lives and their work also need study. And if it is possible, we need to carry on the work that they are doing somehow at some time. So each and every one of the individuals who I put up on this slide, they are all individuals who have worked under great difficulty. And despite working under these difficult conditions, they have made some remarkable contributions. You may have heard recently, Dr. Himmat Rao Bhavaskar was awarded the Padma Shri. <clears throat> Dr. Bhavaskar works in Mahar, again in a poor area with poor people. And Dr. Bhavaskar, early in his career, identified a form of treatment which could save the lives of people who, were, who had been bitten by toxic venomous scorpions. Now, all around him, because it's an area which is infested with scorpions, all around him, patients with scorpion bites were dying. They were dying even in his own clinic till he discovered this treatment which would prevent them from dying and which would restore them to health. <clears throat> it's a drug called Prazosin. We won't go into the details, but Dr. Bhavaskar, having learned that this medicine prevents deaths and renders the patients to bring them back to health, tried to publicize, tried to tell all the doctors in his neighborhood, look, Please use this medicine. It will save the lives of your patients. What do you think they did? They laughed at him. They said, you're stupid. <clears throat> These scorpion bites, when they are bitten, they're going to die. You can't save their lives. It is only when his paper on this form of treatment was published in The Lancet in Britain, the very eminent medical journal, The Lancet, that people in India woke up saying that, yes, Bhavaskar's treatment may have something to it. And when they tried it, of course, they found that it worked. So these are the conditions under which these individuals are working. Even when they do remarkable work, they are ridiculed. People don't accept their conclusions till somebody abroad recognizes them. And then, of course, everyone says that he's great. Now, I'm going to end with this slide. This is a slide which I've put up to show you <clears throat> a little bit about medicine and research. Now, there is a belief that medical research can only be done in huge hospitals. It can only be done in huge laboratories which have equipment which is costing crores of rupees. And research cannot be done anywhere else. It is wrong. This concept is wrong. Research only means trying to find out something <clears throat> that we don't know today. And it can be done anywhere by anybody. And I'm showing you this picture. Also, it is believed that research can only be done by professors, directors of institutes, heads of departments, and very, very senior people. This slide shows you that a medical student did path-breaking research. <clears throat> he lived in the South American uh, province or uh, country called Peru, in the Peruvian uh, region. And at 
as you will see from the legend below his photograph, he lived from 1857 to 1885. So we are talking about the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. Now in that time, there was an illness in Peru, which killed lots of people. And nobody knew what the disease was caused by. Nobody knew how to treat the disease. <clears throat> but they knew that some patients who had this fever, which they called the Oroya fever, once you got the Oroya fever, you were dead. There was no cure for it. So if you had the Oroya fever, it was goodbye. But some people who were relatives of a person who died from Oroya fever, or who were neighbors, or who were colleagues, developed not the Oroya fever, but nodules on the skin, which were warty, like cauliflower, warty nodules on the skin. And people were not sure whether these warts were in some way connected to the Oroya fever. So this young man, <clears throat> Daniel Carrion, said that if we can learn <clears throat> that the warts are some relation or some in some way related to Oroya fever, then we can work on people who have warts and people who die of Oroya fever, and we may be able to learn something about the cause and therefore about the treatment. So he decided <clears throat> that he would take an extract from that wart and inject it into his own vein. When he discussed this with his teachers, his teacher told him, don't do this. Because if you get the fever, you will die. He said, that is true. If I get the fever, I will die. But unless somebody tries this experiment, how will we learn? And so this bold young medical student got a colleague of his to take out a wart from a person who had the wart, grind it up, make a liquid solution or a liquid suspension of the wart and inject it into Carrion's vein. And Carrion developed classic Oroya fever and died within 21 days. This is a medical student. This is a medical student who was inspired that unless we learn what is the relationship between these two illnesses, we will never come across a cure. We will never be able to find it. Knowing that he would die, he injected himself with this suspension and he died. I can't think of anyone who can inspire us more than this young medical student who died in Peru in 1885. Now, in 1909, he died in 1885. In 1909, a man called Barton, B-R-T-O-N, discovered a bacillus, which he showed was the cause of Oroya fever. And some of his work was based on the knowledge which was generated by Daniel Carrion. And in Peru, there is a big statue which has been erected in honor of Daniel uh, Carrion. And in fact, this disease <clears throat> in many parts of the world is now called Carrion's disease in honor of Daniel Carrion. Now I'm providing you with a few references which you might find useful. I'm hoping that you will use these references. These references are just a handful. But if you go through these, you will be led to other references and other references and other references. And eventually, like me, if you're hooked on the history of medicine, you will continue to st study the history of medicine till the end of your life. 
because it's a remarkable series of stories. Some of them are horrifying. Some of them are heroic. Some of them are inspiring. But all of them teach us something about how medicine developed and how medicine can be advanced. <clears throat> the very first of these references, the book by Altman, is called Who Goes First? And this is an entire book on doctors who have experimented on themselves, like Daniel Carrier. It includes Daniel Carrier also. Then, of course, there are other books on history. And the last two books deal essentially with the history of medicine in India. So I'm going to leave you with this small, very small list of references and a hope that you will be inspired to go to them and study them and use the stories of the history of medicine to inspire yourself to become great physicians. Thank you. Pandya. Thank you, Dr. Sunil Pandya, for enlightening us uh, with the history of medicine, the uh, various pioneers and the Indian medical giants, their remarkable contributions to the development of medicine, and uh, some of them who sacrificed their lives. It was a really enlightening uh, lecture, and also uh, not to forget the principles of it, the ethical principles on which Charak based his practice. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, sir, with this, I think uh, we'll end the stream as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, sir.